Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us, joining us today to hear more about how WFP is going to transform California, starting here in San Diego. We're so happy to be joined by Mrs. Jane Fonda and Mr. Maurice Mitchell. Um, and I'm going to definitely let you hear more from them because they are the stars of the hour. Um, my job as a uh, one of the folks working to bring Working Families Party to California is to talk to you a little bit about that effort and to introduce one of our local champions who's also gonna talk about some of our candidates. So we really wanna thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, it's been a long journey getting to this point. Again, my name is Chris Wilson I'm with the Lion Sandy Mobilization Fund, and we have been part of the effort to transform what the political landscape looks like in California by um, bringing Working Families Party here in a real and meaningful way. The, the effort has been about representing working people, representing centering people of color and communities of color in our political landscape to have a voice. You know, a lot of work has been done over the past 10 years to make sure that our communities show up at the voting polls, to make sure that our community shows up, you know, pushing for legislation. And the last frontier to make a permanent change in California's political landscape is to make sure that our people have a voice and who represents us. And so we feel like the only way that we can really do that, to have a voice in the, the, the political rooms of this state is to start moving candidates who look like us, who represent us, who represent the issues that are important to the communities that we serve. Uh, and we, we think that Working Families Party is the best vehicle to do that. We think that in order to move progressive issues in California to identify candidates and electeds who will move those progressive issues and to hold them accountable, we need another political party. We need another vehicle. We need better representation. Um, the, the, the Dem Party hasn't worked for us. The Dem Party has not allowed us to identify progressive candidates. The Dem Party has not been able to stem the rolling tide of moderates and centrists who are not really there to represent progressive issues. And so we are part of an effort, at least in San Diego, to create some sort of left pole that can really, really get to the heart of improving the lives of the people who are tend to find themselves left out of the conversation. Um, and that's a very important conversation for us in California. As we start to see more dim on dim races, we need to be able to identify the candidate that's gonna stand up for our issues. And we need help doing that. And I speak to you as a person who's been a Democrat for the last 20 years the party has not been able to help us do that. It just has not. We need somebody or something that's gonna help us re-inject principles, re-inject a platform that candidates can be held accountable to, that electors can be held accountable to. And I'm sorry, locally, the party has not been that for us. And so we have become part of an effort to um, institutionalize Working Families Party here in California. We're happy to do that. and. What you're seeing tonight is the first effort of working family parties in our region to have an influence on races, political races in our region. And we have selected the Board of Supervisors race in D3, and we have selected the congressional race in CD50. Um, the candidates are Tara Lawson Reamer, Tara Lawson, Lawson Reamer, and Amar Campo Najjar. And we think they represent the best hope the best hope for transforming San Diego, the San Diego region, um, and representing the issues that impact people of color, communities of color, low-income communities, and immigrant communities every single day. And so as part of that, I'm happy to introduce to you our champion on the Board of Supervisors. He's what we call our lone wolf, <laughs> my brother in arms. He stood the good fight. He stands tall every day for our communities. He stands tall for the policies. He stands tall for the people. And he's 
alone on the Board of Supervisors right now fighting that fight. And we couldn't be more proud to have elected Supervisor Nathan Fletcher to represent not just the party, again, but to represent the issues that is gonna change the lives of the people that we represent. The issues, the policies, moving the money where it needs to go to build up our communities, moving the money where it needs to go to support the issues and the, 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 the problems, the troubles that our people face every day. And so my brother in arms, Nathan Fletcher, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Jane, uh, Maurice. Jane, good to see you again. Maurice, all of you who are here. Um, you know, we, we've been in a, in, a, in a battle here in San Diego for a while uh, in terms of trying to, trying to bring structural and fundamental change. And, and a key part of that is the County Board of Supervisors. County Boards of Supervisors sometimes get kind of overlooked a little bit uh, but they are they are one of the most integral levels of government in California. If you actually want to provide help to folks who need it most, uh, when you talk about making sure people have access to health care, when you talk about mental health and drug treatment services, about environmental justice and fighting for air quality and clean water, climate action plans. And I could go on and on and on down the line. But, you know, you can change the federal government, but counties administer the federal programs. And if we're gonna put up barriers to people being able to access those things, and you can change state government, but again, counties in California administer state programs, and we do a whole lot more. And, you know, Chris will remember, it was about four years ago, I went and sat down with Chris. And I said, Chris, we got an all five Republican Board of Supervisors. Uh, they all went to the same school. They got the same mindset. They got the same viewpoint. They would say their board was, was nonpartisan. It wasn't nonpartisan, it was unipartisan. And it fundamentally discounted the lives of, of, of the people in San Diego who count on us the most to come together as a society and look out for each other. And we had an opportunity with one seat in 2018. And I said, I think we can take it. And I said, but it's going to be a fight. They're, they're not going to they're not going to let go. They, they don't want to have the foothold of someone in there. And Chris and Alliance and so many folks said, hey, we're up for the fight. And it was they spent millions of dollars against me, millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, the most expensive county supervisor race in San Diego history. And we, we went out and we fought and we fought for sanctuary policy and we fought for changing our tax code and we fought for criminal justice reform. And we fought for those things openly and clearly. And we won with almost 68% of the vote. We won the first seat, but it isn't just enough to get one seat. And, and for the last year and a half, we've been fighting. We just had a big throwdown over Prop 15 on supporting Prop 15's split role to, 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 to make sure that the wealthiest corporations in California pay their fair share. We've had big fights over criminal justice reform and changing. But in order to truly bring about the change, not just have someone there to have the fight, with five supervisors, we got to have three of us. And then if we get three of us, then we have fundamental structural change. And we're talking billions of dollars. Our budget is almost $7 billion, 18,000 employees, and everything from jail, mental health, all the things we've talked about are decided. And so the opportunity we have in this election with this one seat is to fundamentally make that change. In one supervisorial seat to the south of me, there's two candidates in the runoff, two Democrats, one more progressive than the other, but two that will replace a Republican there. And then the seat to the north of me, that north coastal seat, this is everything. This is the entire future direction of the Board of Supervisors. In every election, there's a contrast between candidates. There's always a choice. But in this election, there is no clearer contrast. We have an incumbent in Kristen Gaspar, a Trump Republican. And I'm not just saying that because she's a Republican and Trump's a Republican. I'm saying that because she bragged in the primary about how proud she was to vote for Trump when she had other Republicans she could have voted for. And then she got elected and she drove our county to spend money joining Trump's lawsuits against the state of California. Our basic policies of sanctuary, of treating immigrants with respect and dignity, she fought. She sat at the White House, four seats over from Trump, next to Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller, while Donald Trump called immigrants animals. And she sat there smiling. She's gone on Fox News a dozen times defending this man. This is, this is a at her core, someone who, who is contrary to everything we believe about equity and fairness and opportunity and justice. And she's fought everything we've done from a climate action plan that's real and measurable 
to fighting our efforts on criminal justice reform, to fighting our efforts on having a tax code that's fair. And that's that's one choice. Now she is the incumbent and she's in she's the incumbent in a district that has historically elected a Republican. But that district has changed. That district is now our, coming our way by, by a significant number. It is, it is plus eight Democrat over Republican and the decline to states are progressive. And so contrast her with our candidate, Tara Lawson Reamer, an economist, a lawyer, an activist, an academic, someone who has dedicated her whole life to progressive causes, her whole life to progressive causes. And, and she will be an incredible supervisor. She knows the issues. She has the values. She's not afraid to get out and fight. And that is the choice that is in front of us. And so the contrast could not be clear, more clear. And then as just like every election has a contrast, every election has an impact. And I am telling you, I, I, I can't think of a seat where one district election will determine the entire trajectory and direction of our whole county. Because the five of us are legislative and executive together. So if you elect a member of Congress, that's good. And I love Amar and I want you to support Amar because that's an important race. But in the Board of Supervisors, you are electing a governor and a legislature together. And there's only five and we have a chance to get three. And if we get three, we will begin changing the policies. We'll begin changing the personnel. And once we change it, it won't change back. Uh, and, and we will be on a true quest to deliver uh, what the people of San Diego deserve in their government and have it represent them. And so... I, I'm, I'm pleading a little bit because just today, Chris, I don't know if you saw it, the realtors came in and dumped hundreds of thousands of dollars in behind Gaspar. Uh, we know that every special interest, every developer, every realtor, every one of these groups that has had power in San Diego for longer than I've been alive, this is the last stand. This is the last stand for them. And so we have to be up for the fight and up for the battle. And so I, I so deeply appreciate uh, any help uh, in any way that you can provide to Tara's campaign. She is fabulous. She is wonderful. She, she'd be worthy of supporting for any office she's running for. But it's not just Tara. It is Tara in a race that will determine which way we go. And if we lose this race, you will have three Trump Republicans, Jim Desmond, Kristen Gaspar and Steve Voss, and they will govern accordingly. And in our progress, we won't have another opportunity at this for, for four years. And the people who need help most, they can't wait four years. We can't wait four years to tackle climate change. We can't wait four years to provide help to communities who need it. We can't wait four years to reform our criminal justice system. We have to start doing it in January. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate all of you. I appreciate your interest. Uh, Chris, you've been fighting this for a long time. Uh, and, and I know you've waited uh, your whole professional life in San Diego to be on the precipice of truly changing the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and it really is important. And Jane, you, you've been with Tara from the beginning. You've been a, such an advocate and, and so wonderful for her. And uh, we're excited. We know she can win. Uh, we can be outspent in the race. Uh, we just can't be outspent like 10 to 1. Uh, and so we got to have a fighting chance. And we're definitely not going to be outworked. There, there's zero chance of that. We got a hardworking candidate. We got a motivated coalition. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you for just a few minutes and just humbly ask for your help, for your partnership uh, to uh, join with us in this in this effort. Uh, and, and once it changes, we won't let it change back. And we'll all, you know, 10 years from now, we'll have a county that will be doing and be held up as a model and doing good things. And all of us will remember uh, that we were there. Uh, we were there for the race uh, that turned this county and that the millions and millions of San Diegans uh, who will never know any of our names, even the supervisors. But they will know that they had a fighting chance in life because we had a county that cared. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate any any help you all can provide. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Nathan and uh, Chris. We appreciate you all hopping on uh, for and introducing our wonderful guests. And I have uh, the distinct honor of introducing uh, our moderator, part of our tag team guest speakers, and my boss, uh, Maurice Mitchell, uh, to, the, uh, to the grand stage. So just a little bit about Maurice. He's nationally recognized in social movements. He's a strategist, he's a visionary. He's done work uh, as one of the founders for the movement for black lives and a, a radical uh, champion for racial, social, and economic justice. 
you know, he kind of, two tragedies really kind of changed the course of his life. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy uh, destroyed Maurice's house in Long Beach, New York, and left him in hotels for months. 18 months later, after Mike Brown's death uh, and murder by the police in Missouri, Maurice relocated to Ferguson to support organizations on the ground in St. Louis. Um, So he has been actively moving uh, organizations and organizing people for years. And in 2018, he took the helm of this wonderful organization, the Working Families Party, as the national director, where he's been applying that passion and experience to make WFP a political home for a multiracial working class movement. So I would hand it over to Maurice. Well, thank you, Mehran. Um, And uh, Nathan, thank you so much for your words. Chris, thank you. Uh, Chris, uh, the work that you've been doing on the ground in San Diego for years is, is inspirational. And it's a pleasure to work with you to bring the Working Families Party to California. Uh, Nathan, um, I feel fired up after hearing, hearing uh, your words of inspiration. And I think it's so critical at a time when we're focusing on national elections uh, that we don't lose our, our focus on all the elections up and down the ballot and how crucial it is to make sure that we focus on the local fights and at the same time, defeat the fascist in the White House. We could do both. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Nathan, for your words. And Mehran, thank you for uh, your, your work and quickly you know, joining the Working Families uh, community and the party just a few months ago and building uh, an amazing team in California uh, with Jorge and others. So just want to appreciate all three of you. Um, and I have the honor of introducing our amazing guest, Uh, Jane Fonda, and Jane has spent the past five decades as a truly tireless advocate and champion for causes ranging from social justice to environmental justice, racial justice, and her compassion and commitment to the many at, at the detriment to the few is a testament to the type of leadership we need, especially today. And I had the pleasure of meeting, uh, meeting Jane uh, when I joined her with, with her uh, Fire Drill Fridays that she's been doing with Greenpeace and building a movement, uh, a very powerful and, and, uh, and uh, diverse movement in order to take on the climate challenge, an existential threat for all of us. And I talked a little bit about how the movement for Black Lives relates uh, to the fight uh, against climate change. And I'm excited to be working alongside Jane in electing amazing candidates in California. So without further ado, let's get to it. Uh, I'd like to welcome Jane and get into the discussion. Jane. Thank you so much, Maurice. I'm, I'm really grateful to be here, to be in conversation with you. I hope it'll be interesting for the people that have signed on. And I wanna thank you, Chris, for the work that you do in San Diego. And thank you so much, Nathan, for coming here and speaking on behalf of of Tara. Um, I I would just like to say a few things about Tara. I've known her since she was in diapers. Um, Her mother and father are longtime activists who worked with me and my my second husband, Tom Hayden, in the Indochina peace campaign. And um, we remain very, very close. They have always lived in San Diego. I I saw Tara being born and I've watched her grow. And it's like a dream. She's the most incredible activist and, and, and candidate. She's, she's an economist, as Nathan said, who's worked at the United Nations and um, at the World Bank to help create jobs and start businesses. And she's interested in work. She, before she decided to run, she was working on a book called The Future of Work, which is uh, in the day, and now that we're facing um, robot robotics and everything i think it's a it's a good thing to be thinking about um she also was an economist who served as a senior advisor in the obama administration and um she's just the perfect candidate and i'm just so excited to be able to support her am i right that working family is also supporting nithya raman yes that's right that's right She's another woman. She went and got arrested with me when we did a fire drill Friday here. She is awesome. And I want to second what all of you have said about the importance of down ballot ticket. You know, I'm not sure if people are aware of 
for the last 20 or more years, the Koch brothers and the Mercers and the Scaifes and, and a lot of the billionaires have been working very quietly below the radar, building up political power, taking over state legislatures, taking over boards of supervisors, winning gubernatorial races, and they got everything in place. And we are now up against the results of that. Two years ago, I was working um, with um, One Fair Wage in Michigan, and we got a ballot initiative on the ballot calling for One Fair Wage. Well, the Republicans knew that that was going to get a lot of people to come to the polls and vote because it, it meant raising their, their salaries. It was especially aimed at the people who depend on tips. Okay, and so what did the Republican legislature do in Michigan? Took it off the ballot and passed it and then gutted it. They gutted it. All that work, all that money disappeared. Right now in Pennsylvania, there's a Republican legislature that's trying to change the election rules that will make it really, really hard for it to be a fair election. I mean, I could keep going, but it's, as everybody has said, it's just really critical to pay attention to the down ballot uh, races. Yeah, absolutely, Jane. We couldn't agree with you more. And, and working families, the down ballot races, the uh, county and city and town and state legislature races, th those are our bread and butter. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but in 2008, when Barack Obama won the presidency and all throughout his presidency, the Democrats won the presidency, but lost a thousand state legislature races all across the country. Yeah. So, you know, we need to keep our eye on the ball. Locally. You know what else happened with when Obama won? See, Obama built the greatest movement in, during his campaign. He built a movement. I mean, he was an organizer after all, and everybody was involved and it was great. He built a movement and he got elected and then it became a movie. Mm. We sat back and said, oh, isn't that interesting? Look what he's doing. Oh, I wonder what he's gonna do next. You know. That cannot happen again, ever. No matter how good we think the candidate is that we've elected to office, we have to hold their feet to the fire and force them to be accountable to us because they're not gonna do it on their own. There's too much pressure coming from the big money guys. That's right. Um, th there's a, a power of social movements, that outside power that holds elected officials accountable, both the elected officials that we like and love and the elected officials that, that we scorn that outside power is so necessary. Our friends need that outside power in order to hold them accountable and flank them to make those really difficult choices. And um, the folks on the other side, they, they need to fear that outside power. I couldn't agree with you more, which brings me to um, uh, a question I, I have for you because you know we're in a moment where the movement for black lives has become the largest protest movement in the history of the country. And, as I understand, you were one of the people in the viewing audience that watched the historic Black National Convention in August. And, you know, you were around during the civil rights movement and the Black power movements in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And I'm just curious, uh, what are some of your reflections from your time as an activist in the late 60s and early 70s and the work that the movement for Black Lives is doing today? Okay, I just want to correct one thing. While the civil rights movement was going on here, I was becoming Barbarella in France. I wasn't an activist. I wasn't. Mm. I didn't become an activist until the until 1970. So I came to the party late, mm -hmm. um, and I learned fast. <laughs> and I knew the Panthers. I knew Huey. I knew Dave, David Hilliard. I knew Elaine Brown. I knew those guys, and I know some of the people involved in Patrice Cullors and others in um, Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives. Um, I think that one of the one of the big differences that movement for Black, that Black Lives Matter was founded by women, queer women, non-binary people. <clears throat> and because it's something that women know about, they they care about people taking care of themselves. They, I remember uh, shortly after Ferguson, I got some mailings 
that were leaflets that talked to activists about how to take care of themselves. And I thought, I've never gotten anything like this from any movement. That was when I found out they were led by women. Okay, I mean, Patrice Cullors is also an artist and a dancer. And they come, and this is, I felt this so strongly in, in the, the National Black Conference a couple of weeks ago. It was centered in joy. It was incredibly well curated, beautiful. It was divided into sections. And there were people that spoke to each topic. And at the end of each topic, there was what you can do about it and how to get organized. And all the way, and then there was singing and there was dancing and there was poetry. And I called Patrice right after and I said, I can't believe how joyous it all was. And she said, yeah, we have to keep the movement centered in joy. Well, the Panthers didn't do that. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't very politically sophisticated then. And so I didn't understand every single thing that led them to decide to take up arms. I know that France Fanon had an influence and so did others. I understand what they were up against because I was here in California and I saw the tanks and the, and the you know, talk about mil militarized police. So I knew what they were up against. And my involvement was mostly helping with bail money, uh, the, the, the guys, because they were pretty much all guys who were being put in jail because they were political prisoners. And so I helped. Um, and can I say that, for example, I called up Elizabeth Taylor one night and I said, can you give me $10,000 to help bail this Black Panther up out? And she did. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, you know, people cared. They were involved and it was very broad. Um, but it was not welcoming the way the movement is now. You know, you wouldn't, there's, there's some lily white, all white communities in California that were out marching with Black Lives Matter signs. That, that, that wouldn't have happened back in the, in the early 70s. So there's, um, I don't know. I think there's just, there's a lot of humanity and a lot of love. A lot of artists are involved, a lot of intersectionality, which interestingly enough, you know, there's been so much talk for decades, well, since um, Kimberly Crenshaw came up with the notion of intersection intersectionality. And then suddenly it's like it's alive and well and actually existing. Everybody gets it, you know? And it's it, it, that gives us power. You know, it's why us with Fire Drill Friday, we focus on climate, why we could very easily bring in members of the movement for Black Lives <clears throat> and, and, and many other people across different issues because we understand how it's all part of the same struggle. You know, the, the civil rights movement, the women's movement grew out of the abolitionist movement. There wouldn't be a SNCC, there wouldn't be an SDS without SNCC. Everything builds, and now we're more conscious of it, I think. And part of it is because, man, we've hit bottom. <laughs> you know, I think when Trump got elected and all the chickens came home to roost, all the neoliberalism that's done so much damage to us just all came to a head, and people suddenly realized that it, this is we're we're in an existential battle, and and. And this is going to determine the future of democracy right yep. now. And we're all in it together. I don't think that progressive people in the United States have ever felt this so strongly. We're standing up for each other. I couldn't agree with you more that we're in, a, in an existential battle. I often talk about it as intersecting crises. And you evoked his name. So let's get into it. Let's, let's talk about um, Trump. I mean, I think... This past week, this past these past two weeks have been, I mean, it's it's hard to even put into words. Um, well, you know what the you know what came so clear yeah. to me with the debate? Yeah. Trump wasn't, he's not running against Joe Biden. He's running against the election. Mm -hmm. He's running against the democratic process. If he can make so enough people say, oh my God, I'm not even gonna watch it. It's just, I give up. There's just no point. 
the political process is just over. He wins, right? That's right. Yeah, I mean, you agree with as, that? as I was witnessing it, I felt like the the feel the emotional feeling that most people felt that was by design that his performance was designed to create cynicism, to, to, to designed to create disgust, designed to create despair because he understands like he's desperate. He sees the power leaving him. He sees the writing on the wall, yeah. and he he's desperate. And so, you know, on one hand, you know, his desperation could evoke fear. On the other hand, you know, he's a wounded, weak, desperate, wannabe despot who's now engaging in trying to nakedly sort of take the election. He'll try, but I, I think just like you said, because we're so united, because we're so motivated, um, he'll try and fail. That's why, you know, conversations like this are important that focus all of us as a community on the things that we need to do in order to get out and vote. You know, uh, you know while we're on the topic of his desperation the intersecting crises that we face. Um, I want to. I want to focus on, and we'll probably. <laughs> I mean, there's so much news that have, has taken place over the past two weeks, from you know the the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Supreme Court fight uh, to that last debate. But I want to pivot to something that I know is is really important to me personally, and I know very personally important to you. Like Maron said, I I was a climate refugee uh, due to Hurricane Sandy, and I lived in hotels and me and my family had to uh, figure out how to rebuild our, our home. And it wasn't just us, a lot of people in Long Beach on the South Shore of Long Island and New Jersey, um, it, it hit us very hard. Uh, so my, my question now is, you know, we're a few weeks away from the election. You've been focused like a laser over the past, you know, over the past few years on the issue of climate change. And could you talk to us a little bit about why climate change has become such a central issue for your activism. <clears throat> it's the young kids. It's the millions of young people all around the world. Um, and Greta Thunberg that rose up and focused on fossil fuel. See these all white guys on some of these environmental organizations, they won't touch fossil fuels. They're all about wind turbines and solar panels and that's great, but they don't go to the root problem. The kids screw it, they went. Fossil fuels, it's their future that we have put at risk, not we, the fossil fuel industry have put at risk and, and they're fighting for their future. And that's what I think has suddenly shifted the, the balance where more and more people than ever before are aware that there's a crisis that's very, very urgent. And so that's really what got me to move from waiting for a protest and then going and joining it yeah. and then doing all the individual things. I mean, the individual things are important. We all wanna reduce our carbon footprint, but if you, if we all did it, it wouldn't add up to what needs to happen in time. We just can't scale it up in time. And what the students and Greta and the experts have said very clearly is, number one, we have to, we have to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half in 10 years by 2030. Humanity has never been confronted with a challenge like that. Our economy, is, is fossil fuel based. Our energy sector is fossil fuel based. So it's really hard and it's gonna take a huge number of people to, to, to allow that to make, to force that to happen. Number two, then we have to gradually phase out altogether from fossil fuels um, between 2030 and 2050. By mid-century, we have to be zero uh, carbon. And while we're doing that, we have to be sure that workers and communities that depend on carbon, the carbon, the, the, the fossil fuel industry, that they are trained and paid while they're being trained to move into the clean, sustainable energy sector. Um, and then we have to pass a Green New Deal. And that's something that a whole lot of people are willing to put put their bodies on the line for. And that's what we're trying, that's the message that we're trying to, to put out. Now, the good news is there are 23 million people in the United States who know there's a climate crisis, know that it's caused by humans and they've not done anything about it because nobody's asked. 
There's 13 million Americans who, who say that they would engage in civil disobedience, but nobody's asked. So there's the great unasked out there and it's our job to ask them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think we have this great opportunity, like, you know, right now we're, we're focusing on defeating Donald Trump and, you know, we're, we're sort of focused on the dumpster fire and the fair and everything else. But just past that, if we do defeat him and we flip the Senate and we take the Senate, uh, the, the control of the Senate away from Republicans, in 2021, we have, actually have an opportunity to, to govern based on everything you talked about and actually pass a Green New Deal. Now, I, I, I'd love to get, you, you know, one of the things that you just said, you know, as you, you spoke a little bit about um, your activism in the 70s, you said that in the 60s, when the civil rights movement was um, ascendant, you, you said you were in France and, you know, you were, um, I, I forgot what you said, like filming Barbarella. Could you talk to, could you talk to the audience about how you made that transition. I think that that's important because we're talking to a lot of people. Some people have been involved in activism for years. Some people are, are, are new to activism. So if you could talk about that, both the transition from being somebody who wasn't involved in movements to being somebody who's deeply involved in movements, and then how do you sustain it for decades and decades and decades? Um, okay, the first part, uh, I was just unaware it's not a good thing to be ignorant, but it does excuse one from not doing more than one did or does. I just didn't know. I didn't pay close enough attention. Um, and I was involved in a kind of hedonistic lifestyle. And I was living in France and um, the Vietnam War started in the 60s and then uh, it began to, the anti-war movement began to grow and I could watch French television and see tens of thousands of Americans marching on the Pentagon and so forth. And I was beginning to feel there's something going on and where the hell am I? What am I doing? And then um, a group of American soldiers they were, they had been in the army in Vietnam and they had, had been in active duty and they had uh, deserted. They were resistors and they came to Paris the way a lot of resistors did. And they sought out other Americans to help them financially or get doctors or where they were gonna stay and so forth. And they found their way to me. And it was very clear to them that I really didn't understand the war. Um, you know, my father had, had, was an awarded sailor. He was in the Navy in the Second World War. And I just assumed that any place where we had soldiers, we were fighting on the side of the angels. Um, and so the soldiers began to talk to me while I was in Paris about the war. And it was hard for me to believe what they were telling me. And they gave me a book by Jonathan Shell called The Village of Ben Sook. And I will never forget it. It was a small book and I read it and when I put that book down, I was a different person. And I went and visited my friend, the great, great French actress, Simone de Beauvoir, who had been a, a resistance fighter during the Vietnam War. I mean, she, you know, it was, a, it was a French colony and the French had fought in Vietnam and lost at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. So she, she understood the situation very well. And she explained to me the whole history of Vietnam. And that was when I decided that I was going to leave France, leave my family and move back here and join the anti-war movement. Well, because it was soldiers who had turned me on to the realities of the Vietnam War, I went to the GI movement. I became a, a civilian supporter for the, the anti-war movement that was, that was within active duty service people and, and veterans. Now, you know, here I was, somebody who, I was famous, I was privileged, I'm white, I'm pretty dumb, I don't know much, the, my depth of experience is tiny, and so I had a lot of studying to do. Well, it didn't take long for me to, to start connecting things, like 
what we were doing in Vietnam. I read an amazing book by Tom Hayden called The Love of Possession is a Dease Disease with Them that related what Ameri North American settlers, colonists did to the, to the Native Americans and what we were doing to the Vietnamese. Um, I loved it so much I ended up marrying the guy. But, and then imperialism, that was the Panthers that taught me about imperialism and the role of that in the Vietnam War. So little by little, I began, my, my knowledge and experience began to build up. And then um, I did something, this is the only thing that's really un different from me and, and other celebrities is um, I was in the field. Like I wanted to know what organizing looked like. So I went to Detroit and became friends with Ken Cockrell, the president of the League of Black Revolutionary uh, Lawyers. And he turned me on to auto worker organizers, UAW organizers, and I would go into the meetings with them and watch them um, work with, with, with workers and things like that. And, you know, I was, I was in Love Canal. I was at super sites. I was, I was with people, not famous people, but just um, working Americans who had totally changed especially women, when women are faced with the dangers, when their children are endangered and their communities are endangered, the most shy retiring housewife can become an absolute warrior. And I kept seeing this happen. And so I realized how profoundly human beings are capable of change. And it's why I will always be hopeful because I know, like I did, I mean, I completely changed as well. Um, and so that, that, that keeps me hopeful. Also, because I'm famous, I've always been attacked for what I've done. You know, every time I speak out and everything like that. And I'm, you know, called names and, 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 uh, and all kinds of things. And what those people never knew is the more they did that, the more I was like, I'm gonna dig my heel. You're not gonna get me to change my mind. I don't get scared. I just kept going. And the more I was attacked, the more determined I became. Now, when I married Tom Hayden, what was good about that was I wasn't on my own anymore. I was part of, I was with him. He was the founder of SDS. He wrote the Port Huron Statement. He was, he was, that was a deep bench. <laughs> he had very deep experience um, in terms of the, of the left and, and movement building. And, um, and then we built an organization. And so what I say to young, young would-be activists right now, the important thing is don't be alone. Join a movement. Join a party like the Working Families Party. Join, you've got to work in concert with others. You know, ever since Reaganism in the 80s, and Thatcherism over in England, the notion of individualism has been put on a pedestal. The word collective has become a bad word to right wingers, okay? Why? Because individualism is a tool of the ruling class. We're vulnerable when we're alone. When we're together, we can't be beat and they don't want that to happen, but that's what has to happen. And Was Jane, I... I so I think I ans answered both parts of your question. No, absolutely. And I, I want to I wanna just drill down on that last point that you, you, you stopped at around, around individualism and the collective. And I think it's so powerful to hear you say that because you're a celebrity, you're somebody that millions of people know. Um, and you know, celebrity culture is not necessarily synonymous with the collective, right? And we're in a hyper sort of neoliberal individual focused reality, especially with the advent of, of social media, where there's ways where people could kind of even become sort of movement celebrities and uh, be individual activists outside of, outside of the collective. You know, but you, you doing the work in the way that you did, actually organizing in the field, uh, building those connections. If you could just talk a little bit more why you think that that um, that way of, of uh, being an organizer, that way of being an activist is, um, is so important. Well, I'm sure that everybody's tuned in here already knows that, but um, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, I mean, I can say that it's self-evident except that I didn't know it until I experienced it. <laughs> 
um, I mean, as individualists, we can, we can, as individuals, we can just be, you know, lopped off and thrown away and everybody, you know, forgotten. We mean very little. Yes, there are great voices that rise. Frederick Douglass, uh, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, there, there, you know, there are voices, great Eleanor Roosevelt, Grace, but they're, they're embedded in movements, all of them. And there's several things that, why being embedded in a movement is important. First of all, it's where the power is. There's strength in numbers. It sounds like a cliche, but it's something that we have to remember. The only way that history has ever changed is when large numbers of people have gotten together and fought for it. You know, back in the 1960s, the only, the only time in American history that comes anywhere close to what we're going through now was the Great Depression, which my dad lived, I was born at the end of it and my dad lived through it and I heard stories from him. And, you know, there were, people were starving and homeless and desperate and, you know, the country just almost went under. And um, people filled the streets in Washington and demanded of Roosevelt that he create jobs and help people. And he said to them, I agree with you. Now go out and make me do it. That's what we have to remember. We have to make them do it. When I was um, for four months doing my fire drill Fridays in DC, I was asked to come to speak to the Senate task force on climate, climate change. And I asked them, I said, do you think what I'm doing is right or should I be doing something different? And it was Ed Markey said, no, this is exactly what we need. Build an army, those were his words. And he's a moderate, build an army and make it big. We need that pressure from the outside and all the other senators agreed. And you know, unprecedented numbers of people are gonna be required in whatever form it takes. It depends on what happens in November, but we're gonna have to be in this. It's, this is when, after November, we have to really roll up our sleeves and, and, um, and, and get to work. What can you do as an individual? You can talk a lot like I do, but you can't make change not really. I don't know if any of you have seen this new Ryan Murphy movie called, I think it's on Netflix, it's called Hollywood. And in the course of this mini series, individual people at various movie studios decide, yes, we can have a black woman star in this movie. And yes, we can have a gay guy doing, it's like there was no movement it just was an individual decision. And that was what was wrong with, with the whole project. I, you know, you can't make those kind of changes without decades of fighting with people really getting, doing everything they can. Now in the beginning you protest and you lobby and you petition and you march, and then that doesn't work. And so then you do civil disobedience and you put your bodies on the line and history shows that's what works. That's, that's right. And so let, let's drill down to like some of the brass tacks on that, because you, you talked a little about, and we, we referenced it, the work that you're currently doing with Fire Drill Fridays. And before, uh, and I think this is remarkable. So the Working Families Party, we have our, our program in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and uh, Arizona and uh, Georgia and, and a, a number of other states. Um, folks in New York, by the way, vote on the Working Families Party line. Uh, for, for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris um, in, in New York, the Vote WFP campaign. Um, but the reason why I reference our work is that we have a, a grassroots army, texting, calling, reaching out to, to their neighbors as well as folks all across the country. And you shared something with me before this broadcast that um, the work that you're doing with Greenpeace and others with the Fire Drill Friday, you're building an army that, that's reaching out to I think you, you, uh, you reached, have reached a million people so far. And if you could just talk about the work that you're doing um, and uh, the movement that you're building, I, I'm sure people would be really excited to hear that. Well, when I, a year ago, Labor Day, uh, when I, I read a book, books seem to do it for me. When I read a book by Naomi Klein called On Fire, the, um, the Burning Case for a Green New Deal. 
And that's what made me realize that I wasn't doing enough and I needed to uh, get out of my comfort zone, as Greta Thunberg says, mm -hmm. and, and called Annie Leonard and asked Greenpeace to help me and went to DC. We had no idea if it was gonna work. You know, maybe it was just gonna be some, you know, an aging movie star bopping into DC and trying to stir up some trouble. I mean, big deal. We didn't know. The first, the first Friday, I think there were 20 of us. There were more reporters than there were us. We didn't even know the chance. It was, it was like, I don't know. It's kind of like giving a party and nobody shows up. And then the next week there were more and then more. And then people started coming from all over the country. And every Thursday night before the Friday, we would have a teach-in and tens of thousands of people were tuning in. And around the end of November, Annie and I looked at each other and people were saying, can't we, how do we bring this to our town and our city? They wanted to bring it national. So we decided I needed to write a book about it, which is out. We wanted it to come out before the election. And, um, you know, we have to make this into a, into a national movement. Now, I had to come back to California to start filming the final season of Grace and Frankie. So during the time that I got back and to where COVID hit, we did two in-person Fire Drill Fridays that were fabulous here. Then COVID hit. <gasps> Lord, what do we do now? Well, let's try, let's try doing it on Zoom. I'd only done it Zoom once in my life. That was in the Greenpeace office in DC. I didn't even know what Zoom was. So we started with this thing. And now let's see, in um, August and September, all together, 3 million people. Last Friday, it uh, was 750,000 people followed us. We average about 400,000 a Friday. We have thousands of volunteers working. We divide them into teams of 500. And, and by the way, they love it. So one team like texts voters. We, we've already touched a million and a half voters. We have a million still to go. Texting, calling, phoning, postcarding, and then a specific team who speaks Spanish working in the Latinx community. And uh, the, they write me, the, the volunteers, and they tell me how much it means to them. First of all, they feel that they're making a difference. People need to do something that makes them know that they're that they're that, that they're doing something that matters, and that's a great anecdote for um, for depression. I was so depressed before I went to D.C. last year, so they're they're overcoming depression. They're doing something that they know makes a difference, and they're making new friends, and they're having a blast. This is how to build a movement. You got to have fun. There has to be singing and joy and friendships, you know, I, I didn't know what the term jail support meant when I first went to DC last fall. <laughs> and, um, and then I got arrested five times and I knew what jail support was because I'd come out of jail and there they'd be. I was so surprised the first time, you know, with tangerines and nuts and water and juice and everything like that. And it just felt so good. And then I couldn't keep getting arrested because if I did, I'd have to be in, in jail for, you know, like four or five months and I wouldn't be able to do Grace and Frankie. So I became part of jail support and every single person that got arrested, I would hug them. It was like, I'm building a movement one hug at a time. And it felt so good. And we've stayed in touch and it's just wonderful. That's, that's such a great story. And also, what I, what I think is instructive about it is how it started. So, you know, it, it didn't start with a bang, but it's built and you've built this army. And I think that that is, you know, for folks who are organizers and activists who, uh, and folks in movement who are watching now, you know, like to me, that story talks about the, the, the need to be consistent, to stay focused on your vision and not to be deterred if you start off with a few people, that you start off with a coalition of the willing and then you could build yeah. Into, into a movement. But you know, this is where Annie Leonard, she's so brilliant. She's such a great strategist. She is the director of Greenpeace USA. She knew that if it was going to work, before we did one fire drill Friday, I had to meet with all of the, the environmental groups in, in DC, including the young people, the Sunrise and the Fridays for Future and the Extinction Rebellion and, and all of them and get their buy-in. Tell them what we were doing, 
what the strategy was and, and get their buy-in. And they all ended up speaking at one fire drill Friday or the other. And our, our, what we were aiming for, we were trying to reach those people, the 23 million uh, people who, who know there's a climate crisis and nobody's asked them to do anything. That was who we were working for. And I can tell you that by the end, the last one was January 10th, we knew we'd succeeded because most of the people who came and most of them were women and most of them were older and none of them had ever done anything like that before. And it was like, yes. That's wonderful. So I, I wanna talk, I wanna, there's been a theme in this conversation, right? Um, you talked about how most of the people in that final in-person Fire Drill Friday were women. You've, uh, you've talked about how when women specifically are transformed through the work, um, how, how deep their leadership can sort of transform movements. Um, you talked about how um, one of the one of the features of the movement for Black Lives today is that it's led by women and gender non-conforming people and, and non-binary people. There, there's, a, there's a through line here in this conversation that I wanted to lift up around the leadership, specifically the leadership of women uh, that I'd like you to kind of expand on. Well, we're facing right now collective crises, whether it's the pandemic, racial injustice or the climate crisis. These are collective crises that can only be solved through collective action. It couldn't be happening at a worse time because as I said earlier, we are living through a period of human history where individualism has been canonized. You know, it's just depressing how, uh, anyway, I, you know, you all know, you understand what I'm talking about, but here's the thing. For all kinds of reasons, women are less vulnerable to the disease of individualism than men are. Partly we're socialized to be the caring gender, taking care of people, you know. But also, and I have a whole chapter in my book about it, all the way back to the days of hunter-gatherers, Guys would go out with their spears to kill and bring back meat. And half the time it, it didn't happen because it's, meat's hard to get then and now. <laughs> and, and the women would stay behind foraging for the nuts and the fruits and the roots that actually sustained the, the community. And they would come back and sit around the campfire and the older ones would tell the young ones where the tiger was hiding and where the bad water was and which roots were bad and exchanging remedies and helping with a woman giving birth, taking care of babies while the mother went out looking for berries and things like that. We, the interdependence of women evolutionarily has been baked in to our DNA. You know, it's why sewing circles, uh, quilting bees, book clubs, it's always women getting together to do something, but there's actually a whole much more profound thing happening while they're doing the sewing and the quilting and the, and the <clears throat> reading of books and things like that. So it's part of us. So this is our time. This is our time. Plus, there are more older women that's, we are the fastest growing demographic in the world. And we kind of know it in our bones and we don't give a fuzzy rat's ass anymore what people think, you know? And I don't think that I'm that different from a whole of, you know, I'm not married or living anymore with a man who doesn't like strong women. I can do whatever the hell I want and, and I know what I want. And, and a lot of older women are like that. We have nothing to lose. You know, the distance between our birth and now is huge. The distance between now and when we're gonna die is small. What are they gonna do to us? Not much, right? We know that we wanna go out feeling we've played our, our part and done our bit. So for all those reasons, plus women bear the brunt of the climate crisis. 80% of climate refugees are women and we're the last to be rescued. And you know, in the global South, women 
they harvest the crops, they plant the crops, they find the water, they chop the wood. They, it's women who interface with the natural world to allow their families and communities to survive. So when there's a, an extreme weather event, it makes the women's work so much harder. She may have to work, walk a whole day to get water and she may never find it. So all these things, you know, oh, and then we have more body fat than men do. Did you know that? We do. And fat, it's why whales sequester carbon. We sequester toxins in, in our body fat. So we, are, we carry around a lot of toxins in our bodies. And when, when we have babies in our, in, our uter in our bodies, they get those toxins. And when we nurse them, it comes through our milk. And so we're carrying the climate crisis in our bodies and passing it to our children. And we know that and we suffer because of that. And so we're more willing to really lay our bodies on the line to stop already with the fracking and the drilling and the pipelines and the things that are killing us. Mm. Jane, that was a word. You, you took us to church. Thank you for that. Um, so there's, uh, we have a few more minutes of this discussion and then we're gonna take some Q&A from the audience. In, in our last few minutes, I wanted to talk about um, something a little bit closer closer to home. You know, we started off talking about San Diego County and some of the um, races that we're getting involved in and the candidates we're getting involved in. Now, um, you, I, want, I want to talk about, if you could just talk about two things. Number one, like you're a member of the Working Families Party. And so I, I'd love for you to talk about that, like the role of independent political power and in ensuring that we avoid climate calamity and we elevate that leadership that you talked about that's sacred and powerful leadership of women and gender non-conforming folks and lgbt folks and other people who have been on the periphery of power how does that relate to joining uh independent political organizations like the working families party so that's number one and number two um why california when everything that's going on around the, the country, when you know there's there's uh, fights in swing states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and other places that we all we all care about, you know, a lot of people say California is just really blue and really progressive. Uh, why focus on local fights in California? So if you could talk about those two things. Okay, I'll start with the second one. Well, okay. I'm here right now because this is where I live and there's a COVID pandemic, and so I can't travel. You no. better believe that if it weren't for COVID. I would be in Michigan. I, my heart is in Michigan. I would be there fighting like hell. And then in Pennsylvania too, oh man, you've got your hands full. Have you heard about what they're trying to do with the new election laws? Absolutely. Changing election laws in the middle of a, oh, it's really, really scary in Pennsylvania. As Trump said, bad things are happening in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here under normal circumstances, but you know, I'm also a working actor. I can't believe it at my age that I'm still a working actor. Um, that I'm a, a working actor. So you know, this is this is where I am for work. But so that answers that part. So I I have always been ever I've been worried about third parties because of they siphon off, you know, I mean, look what happened in 20. My kids in 2000, I mean, my kids both voted for Ralph, Ralph Nader. I was so angry because they didn't understand. I love Ralph, but they didn't understand strategically what that would mean. So I, you know, I wasn't too keen on the working families party in the beginning. And then I started noticing that you were supporting people that the that were running as Democrats or Democratic Socialists, but that the Democratic Party was, well, I can't say behind, but some of them, some of your candidates, you weren't, com you weren't competing with the Democratic Party in the same way that other third parties have, it doesn't seem to me. But what you're doing is you're pushing the Democratic Party and man, does it need to be pushed. Um, I'm, I'm a Democrat. My dad was a Democrat. I know that if I ever changed that he would come down and do something bad to me. I, I, I'll always be a Democrat, but I wanna do anything that I possibly can to help push the Democratic Party 
away from neoliberalism. And it seems to me that the Working Families Party does that. I love the candidates that you support. I like the way that you very thoroughly uh, vet who it is you're gonna, that you're gonna end up supporting. And I like the people that you support. And so why wouldn't I wanna be part of it, you know? Is it okay that I'm also, I'm still a Democrat? It's all right, Jane, we take all comers. And, you know, and um, at the Working Families Party, we don't, we don't force people to choose affiliations. We're a big tent, right? And, and, and as long as you have that analysis and you agree that neoliberalism that, um, and the intersecting crises that we're all facing and patriarchy and white supremacy and, and capitalism, um, those structures hold us back and we need to constrain the power of organized capital and expand the power of everyday people. If you believe that, then you're a Working Families Party member or a member in waiting. And um, you can have multiple affiliations and be a part of the Working Families Party. So we're happy to have you. Good. Good. <laughs> See, I'm also, uh, I, I, you know, most of the people that I work with um, want to do away with capitalism. And he here's my take on that is number one, you won't win then. Because if, if you run on doing away with capitalism right now in, the, in this country, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to win. I, I like Joseph Stieglitz of heavily regulated capitalism can do the trick, or at least let's try that before we give up on it, you know? And, you know, I have spent a lot of time in socialist countries. I, in 1989, when the, when the Iron Curtain fell because of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia and, and Eastern Europe, I went there right away and talked to people right after communists fell. And they took me around and showed me what socialism had done to the environment. But the open coal pits, the air so dark, you think it's nighttime when it's the middle of the day. Rivers foaming from pollution. I mean, socialism is worse for the environment than what we have now, okay? So socialism is, democratic socialism is a whole other thing and we have to educate people as to what that is. But um, just so you know, and you can kick me out of the party if you want, but I'm for a heavily regulated capitalism right now. So we're, we're a big tent, we're a big tent party okay. that, that includes okay. socialist, democratic socialists and um, people like yourself who believe that heavily, const uh, heavily constrained capital could coexist with democracy. And we need, in order to defeat the fascist and the far right, we need a big tent that is not sectarian, so we could have these debates. So, you know, part of being in a party is having these debates, right? And we don't kick people out um, when, we, when we engage in principle struggle with our comrades and we debate about these things critically. It sharpens us, it makes us stronger. And we should be able to sustain that debate and difference and be in the same party. So we welcome- I knew that. I, I knew you weren't gonna really kick me out. <laughs> I, I knew that that was your position. I was just- <laughs> for sure. It's so, so Jane, um, and thank you for your membership, Jane. Um, we, we appreciate it. And, um, you know, you're, you're a celebrity, you're an activist, but you're also a, a grassroots rank and file member of the Working Families Party. And we really appreciate that. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience. So if you're game, I could share some questions that we have from, from folks in the audience. Always game. Okay, great. Um, so question number, number one is from uh, uh, somebody who's uh, Nor, Norbese Flint from Los Angeles who asked, what is the biggest issue of this election that is not being talked about as much in the news? Well, of course I, I would have said climate, but it's climate is actually being talked about every day in the news. And you know, even during the debate, it came up more than it, it has before. Um, can't think of an answer right now about, I, I, I think that there's a lot being talked about. Maybe too much is being talked about, in fact. Um, well, we'll go to another question and then you can revisit that one. Uh, I'll be about that. So, so yeah. yeah, so Ellie Cooper in, uh, in Austin, Texas asked, what do we need to do to get the Green New Deal? So, and, and so this is for folks all across the country. What are our marching orders to get the Green New Deal? 
Well, that is a great question. And it's, it's, it ain't gonna be easy because it has been so vilified. You know, it's already got a lot of baggage. So maybe it'll have to be called something else. But first of all, when we're talking to people about the Green New Deal, it's important to make it clear. It's only 14 pages long. You can read it in four minutes. It's a vision. It's a, it's a, it's a visionary path to a future. It beckons us to a future that will be healthy and clean and equal. And it centers justice. Now, I know there's a lot of people, oh, I get so much heat from people who say, why don't they just stick to the climate? Why are they talking about justice? Why are they talking about good jobs for caregivers and teachers? And what does that have to do with climate? I'll tell you what it has to do. If we, if we don't, see, it's not just climate that's unraveling. It's not just our ecosystems. Our society is unraveling. There's a crisis of empathy in this country. The, the mindset that has brought us the climate crisis and the COVID pandemic and racial violence and all that, that mindset has to be dealt with along with climate or we're not gonna really solve the problem. And one of the things, the most important thing that the Green New Deal is it calls for, as we transition away from fossil fuels to the clean, sustainable energy future is paying first attention to the frontline communities who have suffered the most from what the fossil fuel industry has done. And I was never so aware of this until I did Fire Drill Fridays, both in DC and here. I mean, one hour south of here, an hour north of where you are, families are living, they can open their window and touch an oil derrick drilling right outside their window or their church or their playground flares, methane flares going off right next to, next to playing fields. Kids who have to keep inhalators for, for their asthma so they don't pass out. People dying of cancer and heart attacks. And that's true in Cancer Alley in Louisiana and in Houston and in so many parts of this country. People are dying because they, they live in, because they are people of color, they are low income, they're indigenous, and that's very deliberately where the fossil fuel industry puts its stuff. And they call these areas sacrifice zones. Who cares what happens? Meatpacking plants to Donald, whatever his name is, Trump. <laughs> to Donald Trump are sacrifice zones. They're just immigrants. They're just black people who work in, and let them die, who cares? You know, and retirement homes where the most people are black. He doesn't care, they're sacrifice zones. And when I realized, because we made a real commitment with Fire Drill Fridays, there was not gonna be a stage full of white men, ever, ever. It was always me and then a bunch of people who were frontline people and my celebrity friends who introduced them and so what the Green New Deal does, it centers justice, which is what Roosevelt did, you know, when he was creating all his solutions to the great, he, he, he started many of the programs in places that needed it the most. They also happened to be places where people hated him and thought he was a communist or, you know, fascist and all that. You know, we should be putting clean energy plants in valleys in, in Kentucky and in West Virginia for all those coal miners who are suffering from black lung and their health benefits have been cut by the coal industry. We should be bringing these into places like Flint, Michigan. And you know that's what the Green New Deal calls for. And it's calling for re-envisioning an economy so that low carbon jobs which is where a lot of people are gonna to have to go to work, are respected as is reflected in a living wage where you can support a family and send a kid to college and never have to worry about feeding yourself and your family. 
teachers, home caregivers, delivery people. Nobody in this country should be living anxious about where their next meal is coming from. That's, that's what the Green New Deal calls for in a very kind of sketchy way. Now, some very smart people have put together what they call the climate president's first 10 acts. And if, please, Joe Biden is elected, we're gonna demand that he do 10 things in his first 10 days. We have 10 years, he has 10 days to do these 10 things. And it's like, put us back into the Paris Climate Agreement, declare a climate emergency, no new fossil fuel permits, period. Um, these are things that he can do by executive action. So we're gonna, we're gonna use every ounce of our power to make that, to make that happen. And pass the New Deal is, is one of them, but it may not be called that because we don't wanna get Biden into you know, a whole lot of trouble. I mean, all of these rats, you know, these proud boy types that are also in Washington, they're not gonna disappear if, if Trump either dies of COVID or is not reelected and ends up going to jail. They're gonna still be there. So we have to, we have to, we have to make sure that, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't hurt Biden, we pressure him, but we allow him a little movability. Maybe it's not called the Green New Deal. Maybe it's not called anything in particular, but the content of the Green New Deal would be, would be passed. And one of the things that I love about the Green New Deal, because my dad came from Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm very fond of the Great Plains, is dealing with agriculture and farms. It talks about getting rid of factory farming, agro-business, and going back to regenerative agriculture, you know, and shoring up the healthcare system. The COVID crisis has exposed some real needs in this country that, re that reflect on the, on, the, on the climate crisis, a strong central government, which is the exact opposite of what you know, Trump and his backers want. A strong government that's prepared, that listens to science, right? All of that is necessary for, for to, to, to face the, the, the climate crisis. So there's, there's lessons that we're learning that I think might make it easier after Biden is elected to pass new Green Deal style changes that we need in this country to face all of our multiple crises together. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a, another question and you, you touched on it and you know, you're, you're a very dedicated political observer so nothing gets past you. And this, this person, um, Patricia Day asked this question and her question is Republicans are moving drop boxes out of huge cities and leaving only one drop box in the city Texas. for millions of people of color to drop their votes on. How do we mobilize the people to stop this uh, with the election right around the corner? Patricia lives in California. She says, how, I live in California, but how do we help? Well, I know that this is happening in Texas in particular. There's a huge county that has so many people and they took away 11 drop boxes and there's only one left. I don't know whether it can be taken up by, um, you know, legally, maybe it can be stopped um, we did stop DeJoy from doing a lot of what he was doing. He's the postmaster general, big Trump supporter. And we got him to stop taking out post, you know, post office boxes and sorting machines and everything like that. So maybe there's a legal way to stop it. Um, but there also may be a way that progressive people can carpool and drive people if it comes to that. If we can't change it in the courts um, or by political outpouring, because I don't even know if we stopped a joy and it hadn't even gone to court yet. He was being threatened with a court case, but I think it was simply, there were demonstrations all over the country, just uprisings. So let's have an uprising in Texas. I just don't, I don't know the organizations in Texas, but maybe Working Families Party could tell us which are the, are the, the organizations that can mobilize um, against this in Texas and we could help them. You know, maybe those of us who are younger could go physically go there or at least send them some money. 
Yeah, we have a we have a party in Texas, um, and we have some amazing organizers on the ground in Texas, and we'll make sure that everybody in the audience gets uh, some uh, contact about how they could get involved in that fight. Also, we started a project with the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice Project called the Frontline, where we're um, bringing as many folks from the streets, folks who have been been on the protest lines for the past few months into these fights. Because when a fascist is on the ballot, yes, absolutely, GOTV, defending the election, defending the vote, that is a resistance activity. So folks could also get involved, get involved in the front line. And, and in Michigan, they need, they're missing 4,000 poll workers. Poll workers are so important right now. You know, in 40 years ago in the 80s, the Republicans created these elect, these poll watchers, armed, uniformed poll watchers in black precincts who would scare people so that they would end up not voting and just leave. It was so bad that they were outlawed for 40 years. This year, for the first time, they're bringing it back. There are going to be armed uniformed uniform poll watchers. So there's been a call. I mean, Obama issued the first call for poll watchers. Some states have enough, but I just read today, Michigan needs 4,000 more. They just got 30,000 to sign up. They need 4,000 more. And there are other places that need some. So what you can do is you, you, you type in the name of the state, and then you can say, be a poll watcher, and it'll tell you what to do and how to sign up. And it takes uh, training. You, you have to be trained. So it, it's important to do it right away. That's absolutely right. In fact, we have a program at Working Families called Election Defenders, uh, where, where we train folks on, on how to, how to uh, be poll watchers and how to ensure that when, you know, we know we've heard uh, from the debate stage, the president say that he wants his followers to go to the polls in order to watch, yeah. watch very carefully. Yeah. And we know that's not even coded language, right? He's basically, um, you know, trotting a path in order to create those confrontations. And so we, we think it's very important that people don't, people keep their eyes on the prize and that we create the conditions where everyday people, especially working and poor people, especially working and poor people of color, don't just um, tolerate the long lines, but feel empowered when they vote. Um, and so we're going to ensure we're, go and it's a coalition. There's a lot of organizations who are involved in it. And it's such a big need that no one organization could take this on. Mm -hmm. But we're going to ensure that that people leave that experience voting empowered, uh, feeling good about their contribution to their democracy, um, the opposite of what uh, Donald Trump wants to do. And that's something that everybody could participate in, not just voting, but ensuring that people feel um, safe and uh, in control and uh, self-determining what they what they believe in in their community. Yeah. God, I wish I could be a poll watcher. Oh, I lived in Georgia for 20 years. I'd be there in a blue minute. I'm too old and I have a compromised immune system. But listen, I watched, I don't know how many of you, if any of you watched Rachel Maddow last night, it was really scary. What she said is happening in Philadelphia. I'd really look into it. It's, it's gotta be dealt with very, very fast. It's very serious. Yeah, and we actually, we have, um... In fact, I think in our audience, some of our Philly folks are here. Um, we have a we have a party in in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania. And yeah, you're you're absolutely right. The the um, the ground zero of this fight are in the swing states, right? You know, so it's it's no surprise the Republicans, the white supremacists, Donald Trump, they know that if black folks in Philly and in Detroit and in Atlanta and Latinx folks in Arizona and in Phoenix go out and vote and have access to the ballot, they lose. And so there's, you know, there's not even a veneer anymore. It's just openly white supremacist activity in order to, to suppress the vote. Right. Um, I mean, we're almost, you know, this is our final minute before uh, we close, but we're, we're, we're ending where we started. Um, these ultimately to me, and I'd love in your in, in one minute if you could respond to this I feel like this is the the last and dying gasp of a, of a system that is in, incompatible with life uh, and you know it's it's violent it's it's scary but to me it's the um, the hallmarks of desperation from a way of life and a system 
and a group of mainly very wealthy men, very wealthy white men that understand that uh, their way of doing things and their ideology uh, and their framework is, is no longer acceptable and people are rejecting it. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing all of this ugliness. Uh, they no longer could just hide it. Uh, they, they, have to, they have to just so, sort of surface their, their naked obsession with power. And in doing that, all of us see it and it, it backfires. All of us feel more, more emboldened to go out and vote, to go out and protest and do all the things necessary. At Working Families Party, we say, yes, vote and protest and organize and study. And, uh, and if you're in a union strike and protest again, all of the things, all of the activities in order for everyday people to be able to pull the levers of power. So on that note, in your final minute, Jane, um, any reflections on that, on that concept of maybe a political realignment, a social realignment and the, the ending and dying of this sort of neoliberal patriarchal system and possibly the beginning of something regenerative? I just feel so lucky to be alive right now. Aren't we all so lucky to be alive at a moment when the decisions we make can make the difference between hundreds of millions of people living or dying. Every half degree of climate warming, millions of people die. We can stop that. We can stop fascism. We are at a point where we can, this is a crossroads. It's an existential crossroads. And, and we are people who can help determine which way humanity goes. What a great gift. What a tremendous opportunity. We're just so lucky. We have to use it with every ounce of intelligence and courage uh, and wherewithal we have, because you're absolutely right. This is it. This is it. And, um, you know, I just think um, COVID is God's gift to the left. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is a terrible thing to say. I mean, I think it was a very difficult thing to send down to us, but it has ripped the band aid off who he is and what he stands for and what is being done to average people and working people in this country. We can see it now. People who couldn't see it before, you know, they see it now and we have a chance to harness that anger and make a difference. So I just, I feel so blessed to be alive right now. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you on that note. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, these inter intersecting crises, um, the, um, the pandemic, um, the climate crisis, the, the reassurance of the movement for black lives. In 2020, we've all witnessed, all of us, not just us in the US, but all around the world, the limitations and failures of these systems that we were told were designed to work for us. And now we know, all of us know, that these systems are not designed to work for us. In fact, these systems are designed in, in order to, to loot from us, in order to uh, limit our, our human potential. In, in order, you know, these systems are designed for more and more growth, more and more wealth accumulation and not focused on, on human potential. And so this is an opportunity if we, if we seize it. Um, and I, I know we will in, in the final days uh, coming up to this election. And you know, the other thing I want to do is you, you have a book that's out, and and in this book it, it it talks about a lot of these a lot of these topics. For so for folks in the audience, you know, definitely pick up Jane's book. What can I do? My path from climate despair to action. Um, and if you're watching this live stream, um, then I'm just gonna to your right. You'll see that you can make a contribution to support this amazing work, the work that we've been talking about for the past hour. The, the grassroots organizing that's happening on the ground in California to elect a number of uh, a number of grassroots independent candidates. Um, so please get involved and do that. Click on that link and donate. Uh, this is a this is a conversation, and but this is a fundraiser, and we want to raise money and take action. Um, and so I'm going to ask everybody. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you to do. Please take out your phone, get your phone out. I could, for those of you in the live, I could see you. So let me see, get your phone out, okay. And um, I'm gonna want you to text 
the word, and this uh, this is in honor of our guest, texts the, the name Fonda to the number 30403, and um, that'll sign you up in order to uh, get plugged into the work that we're doing in California and other places. And when you text that word, that'll let you know, that'll let us know that you are part of this special audience uh, in this conversation between me and, and Jane. So I'm gonna give you all a few more seconds. Just don't, don't wait, do it now. Uh, text Jane's last name to 30403. Or for those of you that are in the Zoom, you could uh, go to the link. Uh, for others, I'll say it's wfpus.org slash member and fill out the form to become a member I am a proud member of the WFP, as well as Jane, as well as many of the other people in the audience. If you aren't a member, this is the perfect time to become a member and join a people's focused, a people fueled uh, grassroots movement for the many, not the few. Again, thank you again, Jane, for just uh, being so generous with your time, for so generous with your, your, your story um, and being so committed to the fight after so many decades in the struggle. Uh, it's, 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 inspiration, it's inspirational to see you with so much vigor uh, in this fight and we need that vigor and that energy. Um, and so we appreciate you. We appreciate everybody in the audience that came to be 